let's go ahead and get started then. A um, couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, my intention for this meeting is um, kind of a workshop style discussion. Of course, we got uh, individuals from the first tee and, and Kemper Sports here with us that will present in a, in a little bit. Um, it's my understanding that uh, we've got Troy Houtman, um, the city manager, and uh, is it Mark Manning from finance joining us as well from the city um, to an answer any questions that may arise on that end. And certainly uh, want to thank First Tee and Kemper for being here and, and um, giving up their time to, to present and show us what, they, what they've got. So um, again, workshop style. Um, no votes needed. I think we're just look, looking for a general consensus here. Um, do we want to move forward? Do we want to press pause? Um, and then that should give the city manager, Bob Layton, a pretty, pretty good idea um, what, what the next steps will be. So no votes, um, just a general consensus um, at this time. I don't think we'll be taking any public comment. Um, the reason for that is this is totally introductory. Um, and there will be plenty of time for public comment in the future. I see Dale's hand is already up, so let's get it started, Dale. Uh, just a point of order. Would you mind uh, doing like a roll call or somebody to identify who is on board today? So if you see up at the uh, top of your screen, it says show participants. Well, I've and got a button. Should... I have a button that says plus 16 and I, that, I've got the first. Uh, I'm not sure how to find that. It's in the little toolbar right next to request control. A little icon with people on it. I'm. Oh, show participants. Well, it just says plus, it says plus 21. Okay, it, if there's some way to record who's on board, just so we know who is here for this, uh, can you at least grab yeah, I'll get on my list here. Uh, so it's myself, Eddie Fonestock, Alan Clark, Alejo Cabral, Ben Blake, Jared Cerullo. Congratulations, Jared, on your recent uh, appointment. Uh, Cindy Claycomb, Dale Goder, Reggie Davidson, uh, Penny Garding. Lisa Grissom. I've got a guest speaker, 35. I'm not sure who that is. Um, Troy Houtman, um, Hoyt Hillman, Josh Lesnick, Nancy Knopp. Come on. Oh, sorry, Nancy. Uh, Bob Layton, Jennifer McGana, Mark Manning, David McGuire, Michael Ward, Niall Dillmore, Richard Schodorf, Tyler Schiffelbein. Sorry, Tyler. Tom West, Tori Dethridge, Ty Taving, and another guest. So if uh, if guest speaker 35 could identify themselves and then after them, uh, just guest if they could identify themselves. Okay. We've also got uh, Elizabeth Harlinski and Dee Nelson and Tina Payne on board, so. Well, uh, Eddie. Yes, sir. Uh, this is quite. I wanted to let you know that uh, we have uh, my my replacement also listening here with me today. His name is Phil Simon. Phil, as in P H I L, like Phil Mickelson. <laughs> no. Yeah, but yeah. Simon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Welcome, Phil. Thank you. Dale, does that work for you? Yeah. I'm going to take that as a yes. I hope it is. Um, so with that being said, um, is Troy Hoffman? Yeah, Troy, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you kind of introduce, um, you know, these guys and, and how we how we got to this point. Very good. Thank you, Eddie. I appreciate you uh, getting us uh, started. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I have a few points that I want to share. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Mr. Manning. He is going to talk a little bit about some financial background on this as well. 
He's going to share some of the numbers from uh, the past year and the past few months, as well as what we expect or some of the interpretations we have working with uh, Kemper and First Tee. Then after the city does the, our presentation, we're going to pass this on to First Tee and Kemper uh, so you can hear their proposal. So that's kind of what we're going to have. And then after that, we'll definitely be available to answer any questions. So some introductions. Um, I'm not going to go through every single person on here, but on the call we have members from the Park Board. We also have members from the Golf Advisory uh, Committee. Uh, we have some city staff here as well. Uh, we have the first T leadership, and I'm, I'm going to ask Tom West to introduce anybody from his team. So Tom, if you can go ahead and make that introduction. Well, good afternoon. It would actually be uh, Alan Clark, who's our executive director, is on the call today. All right, thank you very much. And then we also have a Kemper team. And uh, Ben, if you could go ahead and introduce your team, uh, that would be fantastic. Sure. Uh, my name is Ben Blake. I'm executive vice president of Kemper Sports. And Josh Lesnick is on the phone, and uh, he's president of Kemper Sports. All right, thank you very much, Ben. All right, so a little bit of history. Uh, prior to 2020, we had a steady decline in rounds and revenues, and there was definitely a, a need for the general fund to support uh, the golf uh, enterprise fund. Um, so with that, we definitely had some changes, and that was when we actually had uh, this opportunity to change our golf system, and, and we did decommission the golf uh, the Clap Golf Course, and that actually helped we, we uh, remove a lot of our overhead costs. Um, we moved quickly into the COVID situation, which has had a silver lining to a certain extent. Uh, we definitely have seen a, a huge rebound in golf numbers, not just here in Wichita, but across the whole country. So what we've been working on is we've been trying to find new golfers coming to our golf courses. That was one of our number one priorities, and we wanted to develop the youth programs as well. Develop that base so that those folks can actually start growing into the game and make the game uh, sustainable. So in, in with this, we started talking to First Tee about this opportunity in 2020, but it's actually been prior to that with First Tee talking about this idea of sustainability. They've actually been a big uh, proponent of bringing youth into the game here in Wichita and along with the Wichita um, uh, the Junior Wichita Association. I'm not I'm not saying that right. <laughs> Wichita Junior Golf Association. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, we've been actually having a lot of folks interested in bringing in new golfers and younger golfers into our our city. Also with the state of our infrastructure and, and excessive overhead, we've been really having a hard time getting ahead. Um, we definitely have some big infrastructure needs that we need to address. Now, I'm not gonna go through each one of them here, but it's just been a topic and a theme that we've had over the past few years. And it's not just the, the infrastructure uh, hardscapes, but it's also our equipment as well and some of our buildings. So we definitely know that there's some need improvements there uh, the state of our operations, it's definitely uh, changing as we've been kind of morphing into different opportunities. Um, but we have to have a better succession plan. We have a lot of older employees that we need to find some younger ones to come in and actually teach them the operations of not just the, the clubhouse, but also all of our uh, golf course maintenance as well. So there's definitely a need for capital funding. We've talked about that uh, over the years, and we do have a list of uh, capital needs that we need to address, uh, whether it's now or, or in the future, but we need to come up with a sustainable game plan to make that happen. But there's some great opportunities. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of partnerships, and not just the golf partnerships, but other partnerships in regards to marketing, as well as getting uh, different products into the golf courses. And uh, we've definitely made some improvements to the courses. Uh, one of the low hanging fruit items was bringing in the, the goose dog over at uh, McDonald and it's definitely made an impact. I've been getting a lot of positive feedback in regards to there's a lot less golf, I mean, a lot less goose poop 
on that golf course. In our marketing reach, uh, we've definitely been trying some different items, the golf app, as well as some other ways that we've been pushing out a lot of different opportunities for marketing. So um, as we move forward with this, uh, whether it's uh, working with First Tee and Kemper, I think we're giving them a foundation to work with. And uh, there's definitely been some improvements, but we definitely know that there's definitely some shortfalls that we need to address as well. So I'm gonna pass this on to uh, Mr. Manning, uh, he's going to talk a little bit more about the uh, financial aspects that we have. Uh, thank you, Troy. Good afternoon, uh, President Fonestock. Uh, good to see you again. And uh, uh, I'll just give you a brief background on some financials here. I won't go into a lot of detail. Uh, you may recall that we switched to a subscription model uh, recently. Uh, this is a couple bullet points from a presentation I made to the Park Board, I think on the 13th of May of 2019. We talked about how the subscription model would help smooth our revenues, which was a good thing, uh, but that would also potentially reduce our marginal revenues for golf rounds. Uh, we also talked about how it would be very important for us to maximize revenues in areas that were very high margin, which is golf carts and concession areas. So that's kind of how the model was designed. So let's look at what actually happened through 2019 and 2020. And recall, we, we uh, implemented this uh, not, we didn't have full years here, uh, so the comparisons are a little bit of a challenge, but our green fee revenue actually declined a little bit from 19 to 20. Our cart revenue was relatively steady, uh, but our concession revenue also declined. Uh, both of those last two bullets are things that are not really good things compared to what we expected in our subscription model. Now I recognize, of course, 2020 was a unique year, obviously, due to the pandemic. Uh, but the takeaway, I think, is that we needed to maximize high margin uh, items, carts and concessions. And I don't know that the system did that as well as maybe it could have in 2020. Why is that? We have a lot of fantastic city staff, but we talk a lot about core competencies with the city of Wichita. And I'm just not sure whether core competencies for marketing are, are present in our golf system. Uh, so that's something that we'd like to try to address, and you'll see that in a couple of minutes here. So this compares 2019 to 2020. I like to look at uh, amounts per round, kind of equalizes things. Takeaway here is we generated 28 bucks a round in 2019. We generated 26 and a half bucks a round in 2020. In other words, our revenue per round decreased. Again, we kind of expected that with a subscription model, but we were hoping that we would make it up on carts and concessions, and I'm not sure that happened uh, quite as uh, well as we would have liked. Uh, important takeaway at the bottom, you can see our operating costs dropped significantly. Why is that? Because we had an extra course in 2019. Uh, we shed all those fixed costs in 2020, i.e. the closure of LW Clap, which helped reduce our, our expenditures per round. Although I'm gonna tell you that a concern we also have is that maybe $23 a round is too low to spend on the, rev on the expenditure side. And I'll get to that in a second. But anyway, takeaway is we didn't maximize the marginal revenues that we wanted to in carts and concessions, which is where the high margins are. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so Richard, I think you asked about performance for the first two months of this year. So I prepared this slide for you. Uh, it's really hard to tell a whole lot from the first two months of the year because there isn't a whole lot of activity. Uh, but one interesting thing you will see is that green fees are significantly higher than last year, which is exactly what we would expect because now with our subscription model, our revenue stream is relatively smooth. That's fantastic in the low activity months, uh, but the question is how do we maximize revenue in the high activity months? And you know, I can't, I don't have results to show you that we can or can't do that, obviously because those months have not occurred. All I have is last year. Uh, in case you're interested, one reason we've spent a little less this year is, is primarily in the commodities area. If it weren't for that, we would have spent almost exactly what we'd spent last year. Sorry about that. Thank you. Next slide. So let's talk about a potential new model. Again, uh, here you go. Uh, I think you can make an argument that maybe we're not spending enough. We want to enhance the customer experience. We want to have well-maintained courses. And so we want to invest enough money to be able to do that. Uh, but as I've mentioned now, probably about the fifth time, the other thing that we want to do is maximize the low hanging fruit, the high margin areas, concessions, pro shop revenues, cart revenues. And we'd also like to improve the revenue per round if we can, 
What that means is uh, stimulating non-pass players, i.e. new players. Uh, so those are what's important in a new model. Okay, next slide. Uh, so what are some objectives we'd like to achieve in the future? We'd like to be sustainable. Well, how are we sustainable? We need to develop young players. I think that's obvious to all of us. Uh, we'd like to have some vitality in our golf system. I think we do that by enhancing the customer experience and improving our courses. Uh, Finally, we'd like to have self-sufficiency from a financial standpoint for our golf system. Our golf system is designed to be self-sufficient. It was self-sufficient for decades until maybe the last decade or so. We'd like to get back to that self-sufficiency model where the golf system can generate enough revenue to fund its own improvements uh, and perpetuate itself. Uh, so, so here's kind of a, a model. Again, I've used 2020 and I did plug in dollar amounts here. Uh, but we've been talking to outside parties that you'll hear from in a second. And some of the 2020, uh, 22 projections are based on some discussions we've had with them. Uh, but here's kind of a model that how things might work out, we believe. Uh, you can see the takeaway is uh, our revenue would be significantly higher. Well, where will it be higher? Again, in the high margin areas, concession and pro shop. That's what we talked about in 2019. Another takeaway is you can see green fee revenue would be higher, and I'll leave that to, to them to discuss. But again, that's, I think, maximizing revenue uh, from our non-pass rounds. And I think, you know, there's some ways to do that, and I'll leave that to them. Uh, but again, maximizing revenues from our players. Uh, you can also see the operating cost side significantly higher than what the city spent uh, last year. Again, I'm not sure the city level of expenditures would lead to a sustainable system. So it's Kind of ironic, but I think actually you might find that a higher level of expenditures might lead to a more uh, system of greater vitality and sustainability. And again, uh, that's what this model is predicated upon. Uh, finally, you'll see the net margin at the bottom. We generated about 440 some thousand dollars last year. Uh, that was a very good year for us. In fact, in fact, that was the first good year we've had in quite some time. Uh, their model, the alternative model, would generate somewhere in the neighborhood of 786 on a projected basis and obviously this is all projection but you know you got to have a you got to start from somewhere uh so anyway that's uh, kind of what we've been considering uh, next slide please uh this just shows you on a per round basis i won't spend much time here but you can see uh they generate about twice out of concession rounds than what we're generating uh, they generate a lot more in pro shop we essentially have no pro shop revenue in i mean we generate a little bit but it's it's relatively insignificant. So we'd maximize revenues in those areas. You can see green fees. We'd, we'd uh, squeeze a lot more marginal revenue out of our out of our, uh, out of of our our rounds. And you can see operating costs would be about five bucks more around than what we're spending. Uh, but ultimately the net margin down at the bottom is what we probably tune into the most. And you can see, we believe it would be significantly higher. Okay, next slide, please. So what are some of the advantages maybe of uh, partnering with an with a external provider? Uh, one thing we cannot do, we can't leverage national expertise. Uh, I think other entities may be able to do that. Uh, of course, you have more economies of scale, the more courses you manage. Uh, that's an advantage that's hard for us to have with four courses. Uh, I think there's limited downside, but there's a much higher potential upside, uh, which is good for us. And uh, depending on how a contract might be structured, uh, you know, it may be possible to incentivize a provider to uh, perform financially, which again benefits us and potentially could benefit our partner. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, ne next slide. There you go. Uh, so, what what's what's in it for our customer? And we're we're all about our customer here at City Wichita. So, what's in it for our customer? Uh, I would argue that. We would have a much greater likelihood of financial viability. Uh, why is that important? Uh, that means that these courses would be sustainable and have funding for course improvements, which I think uh, we all know are, are important and necessary. I think there's a much greater likelihood of that financial viability if we change our model. Uh, I think you'd see a better customer experience. I think you'd see better maintained courses. And uh, I think you'd probably see enhanced product offerings. Uh, so I would argue all those would probably be benefits for our customers. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, finally, yeah, we have a performance management system here at the city. We like to measure performance. Uh, some of the performance indicators that we believe that we would see are a improvement in our course conditions. 
you know, we've talked a lot about that. How do you measure that? And I think there's a pretty good system where we would try to benchmark ourselves to some local courses that we would consider to be well maintained. And then we would maybe have some uh, external means of comparing our course conditions to those courses to make sure that we met that benchmark. Uh, customer satisfaction, of course, is important to us. And I think we probably would try to develop some kind of uh, survey or metric to measure that. And, you know, I'm a finance guy, so obviously operating margin is a metric that we're interested in. Uh, but again, as I noted above, I think that would probably improve under this model. So uh, sorry to hit you with all that information in such a short time, but that's a high level overview of kind of where we've been and where we think we can go. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's always good to see you as well. Um, does anybody have some quick questions um, on the finance side? Yes, I have um, one real quick. Uh, in in using the um, uh, the comparison for 19 and 20, did you uh, make any adjustment for the the uh, period of time that uh, the courses were shut down um, and obviously no revenue coming in or uh, marginally opened with uh, with only walkers? Yeah, Richard, I did not specifically make any adjustment for that. But you're right, 2020 was a very unique year for a number of reasons. <clears throat> Dale? Yeah, I don't know how much of this we wanted to get into at this time, but one element of this, Mark, we've talked about in comparing these models under the current system there's about 400,000 a year of golf revenue funds that travel to the general fund that aren't itemized costs. I mean, it's just a transfer of funds like the 243,000 in central administrative costs, uh, the 85,000 in public safety fees. In your model, that money just gets transferred over to the operator and becomes their decision about how to spend that, as opposed to the city making the decision to take 300 to 400,000 a year, which has been a source of the unsustainability of the Gulf system over the last decade. Can you somehow account for that in that model? Yeah, that's a good question, Dale. I didn't think I'd be able to get through today without getting at least one question for you. So <laughs> I'm glad, glad, glad I got your question out of the way. Uh, you are correct. The golf system pays the general fund somewhere in the neighborhood of $300,000 a year. Uh, they are purchasing services from the general fund. They're purchasing payroll services, administrative services, and a variety of other services. If we change our model, the city would no longer have to provide those services. Uh, we would no longer be responsible for payroll and admin and all that. Hence, we would not charge the system those amounts. It's pretty much that simple. I, say, but, I, that's, I understand. I mean, there's an argument to be made that that's the service we get. Like, the, I think it's almost 50,000 goes to city manager's office for salaries, 100,000 goes to finance, treasury, and accounting. It's a little difficult to identify that level of service, but that's an argument to be made later. I don't want to take up time with that now. As this gets explored further, uh, I hope the council would pay attention to those. There's a sacrifice on behalf of the city walking away from that 400,000, which they'll do for Kemper and First Tee, but won't do for itself. Um, so that's a, a point to be made to be brought up in later discussions, I think. Well, I will tell you, Dale, again, just to be very brief, but I don't know that the city will be walking away from that revenue because, and not to get, uh, you know, not to go accounting on you here, but uh, we will still spread our administrative costs among the city entities for which we provide administrative services. Uh, so it's possible we the general fund may still recover some of that revenue, but again, not to go too deep on it. But but your point's well taken. That's certainly something we'll we'll take into consideration. Mark, is it possible to um, at at some later time to make a comparison for the um, the June or May through December for each uh, year nineteen and twenty, so that we could kind of look at apples to apples, even a month over month to, um, sure. so we can really look at real numbers. 
Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that, Richard. I, I'll do that. I'll, I'll give it to uh, Mr. Houtman. But I did a presentation to the city council for the uh, fourth quarter report that would have been done in February. And uh, what I did there is I broke it down by quarter, kind of to your point. So you can kind of see that. I'll send a link. I'll send that link to Troy. This has got a couple of graphics in it you may like. Got a uh, question from Niall Dillmore here. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Uh, going back to the to the slides where you have the projected revenue under the new model, um, was that those projected revenues based on uh, Kemper's performance at other golf courses, um, or can you give me a, a roundabout way of, of of how those uh, projected numbers were determined? I'm sure you just didn't pull them out of the air or start from the backwards and work to whatever it takes to make a profit. So, yeah, um, what what exactly was the methodology to come up with those projections? Yeah, that's a great question, Niall. Uh, we've worked with Kemper a little bit. It's probably a better question suited for them. I'm sure they'll address that here in a couple of slides, but suffice to say, we've had a lot of discussions with that with them about that and uh, have a comfort level with their model. So uh, they provided the numbers to you? Yeah, those numbers you're seeing are based on information they provided to us uh, through the course of some discussions we've had. And again, I think you'll see them again here in a few minutes. And then you can probably ask your question, probably get a better answer than what I'm giving you. So the, the city didn't, you or, or the negotiator, whoever is dealing with Kemper, uh, did not um, ask for or look for justification for those numbers? No, that, that's what I'm telling you. We did do, Niall. We have talked to them quite extensively over the past uh, uh, weeks or months or however long it's been. I lose track of time. Uh, can I tell you all those numbers are exactly right? No. Can I tell you that we've had a lot of discussions with Kemper and we understand the basis of their numbers and they seem reasonable to us? I would say that's a yes. But again, uh, they can probably answer all your detailed questions if you have specifics about the about the numbers. And thank you, Mark's uh, comment on this is that they asked for a lot of information from us. They asked how we are performing, what are our challenges what are our expectations and they used a lot of our information uh, to formulate their projections as well okay i think we got everybody's questions um all right dale you still have a question did you have another one and i just want to know when this is timely to ask we've had a lot of questions about this process as to why it's a single uh, sole source no bid contract as opposed to opening it up an RFP for other uh, potential vendors to come forward. Um, is that something to talk about now or do you want to save that for a later component of the discussion? I think we were expecting that question and but I think we wanted to give uh, that opportunity for the presentation for First Tee and Kemper and maybe we uh, are able to answer that afterwards. If that's, that's okay. Fine. Thank you. Okay. All right. So with that, I think we're going to pass this on to Ben, I, I do believe. Okay, yeah, let me uh, see here. Penny, you have the presentation, or should I pull it up? Where, where is it exactly? <laughs> Penny, do you have that? I do. Uh, ben, you had it in the, um, oh, what did we call that? The share tray down at the bottom of your screen? Yes, can you see it now? No. Okay, hold on a second here. I hit the share tray, open share tray. Oh, here we go. Sorry about that. I had to reopen it. There you go. Okay, so Tom, I will turn it over to you and then uh, I will be the, uh, I'll press the buttons here and speak a little later. So okay. go, go right I ahead, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, First off, good afternoon, everyone. And I want to take a quick moment to thank Mr. Layton and Troy Hendricks and Eddie Fonestock for giving us the opportunity to present our vision for Gulf Wichita. Um, and I, after the first 15, 20 minutes of this, I also want to thank Mark for giving our presentation already. <laughs> <laughs> 
he did a great job of summarizing everything that, uh, more or less that we're going to talk about today. We'll dig into the weeds a little bit here. But uh, as you know, this all started several months ago in discussions with the city when, when I found it was a might be an opportunity for First Tee to give back to the city again in some way to grow the game of golf in Wichita. And through the discussions, uh, very quickly, my goal uh, is very similar to everybody else's, is I want to enhance the golf experience for the city golfers. I want to definitely improve the fiscal performance and be able to provide uh, enough sufficient funds for all the deferred maintenance uh, projects as well as any ongoing new capital improvements. Um, ben, you might flip to the next slide real quick with the mission statement and I'll introduce Josh in a minute. This is really um, what we're, what First Tee and Kemper is all about. We want to provide an affordable, high-quality public golf experience for Wichita golfers while delivering positive operating results that enable the courses to be financially self-sustaining and fund ongoing capital improvements. Um, through this process, let me, let me jump quickly to um, what First Tee did in researching and, and arriving at Kemper Sports. Um, on our staff, you'll see him on the screens there some places, Alan Clark, He's our executive direct, director of First Tee Greater Wichita. He has about um, 35 years experience in the game of golf. He's a lifetime member of the PGA of America. And I, I gave him the task of researching who could we come up with, who are the players in management of golf courses, public golf courses specifically, and ones that fit the, the goals and the values that, that we were looking for. And it became very evident very quickly that Kemper Sports was the best choice. Um, they're a family-owned company with, with family values. They have an extensive portfolio of public courses under management. Um, they have an exceptional reputation in the golf industry and they bring their own capacity and their own vision to this whole project. Um, so with that, I want to introduce Josh Lesnick real quickly. He's our pre he's the president of Kemper Sports and have Josh just kind of say a couple of words before we get into the, the meat of the presentation. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you all for having us today. I'll be brief. I, I thought since I don't know many of you, I could just give a little background on myself and, and the company as well as, as briefly as I can be more conversationally since this is a uh, uh, more of a workshop as uh, President Fonestock said. Uh, so um, I'm the president of Kemper Sports. Uh, the company was founded in 1978 by my father and Jim Kemper. Um, outside of Chicago. The first golf course they opened was Kemper Lakes. Uh, and the very next golf course that we took over management of was Vernon Hills Municipal Golf Course, a nine hole municipal golf course down the road from Kemper Lakes, where the mayor decided they wanted to build a golf course as an amenity and uh, called up uh, my dad and we helped him build and operate and we still operate today the nine hole municipal golf course at vernon hills it's where i learned to play golf with my dad i was 13 he was 40 um, and played um, continued to play a lot of municipal golf at vernon hills and then in the town i grew up in as well uh, started working in golf maybe maybe like many of you or some of you you know um, in high school every summer in high school and college uh, worked at kemper lakes and did everything from picking the range to working in pro shop and uh, went to school in Des Moines, Iowa um, at Drake and came to work for our family business uh, right after that. Um, the company today 
manages uh, over 100 golf courses, um, probably close to 130 golf courses, and about 40 of them. I mean, even though our company is known for managing some some big name resorts, if you will, about 40 of the properties we manage uh, are municipal golf courses where we have uh, relationships uh, with a, a county or a park district um, or uh, or a city. Um, and uh, so my and our relationship with uh, with the first T, as Ben may get into, um, currently, uh, I'm sitting on the board of the um, USGA Regional Affairs Committee on the executive committee of Western Golf and have been lucky enough to serve on the board of First Tee Greater Chicago for the last 20 years, which is a chapter that was uh, founded uh, by by my father and Mayor Daly in Chicago. So a very, uh, very big part of what we do is our relationship with First Tee. Um, today, I still sit on the board and work um, on the, the marketing committee, the golf out, outing committee, and the facilities committee, which is exciting because we work closely with the Chicago Park District courses. So that's a little background on me and the company, Ben. Okay. We might, Ben, if we can, let's switch it to that first T video very quickly. It's just a 30 second video. Okay. Hopefully you'll recognize a semi-famous golfer in there. <laughs> um, how you doing, Ben? Well, I'm trying to get it to, to start and it won't. Here we go. Okay. You need to present the. Yeah, you'll need to share your screen or share, share your presentation screen. again. I do. Okay. Huh. <laughs> Not sure what happened there. Hold on a second. I probably yeah. screwed you up. I'm sorry if I did. Technical but... difficulties here. There we go. That won't play. There you go. That's typical. Hit the center, the center of the black screen. No, cannot play no. media. Not sure why. Okay. Well, we'll move on. Um, let's look at the the slide. Um, that's our core value or our mission statement for first T right there. That really tells everything about us and how we try to introduce the game of golf and its inherent values through our three main programs um, to uh, young people from all walks of life. If you'll flip to the next screen, uh, our strategies. This is where uh, we, we do this day to day. This is what we're all about. We wanna provide opportunities to grow the game of golf in Wichita and sustain our public golf courses in Wichita for everyone. We want to create a safe and healthy environment for kids from all backgrounds and spaces. And the way we go about it is through our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, dedication to child safety and our safe sport programming, and the commitment to our nine core values. This is the heart of what we do. This is something we teach every youth that we come in contact. Um, so it is very important to what we do. And then just as a demonstration of how we try to grow the game is through our Kids Play for Free program, which was started about three years ago at the uh, initiative of our program director, Corey Novoscone came up with the idea of raising enough funds through a golf marathon that we could pay for all juniors to play free all year long at L4 of the local courses. And we've been fortunate to be able to achieve that every year. This year was another successful fundraising uh, marathon. So uh, next slide. Oh, that's probably... That's, uh, Click in the that's middle. That's a video that won't work, Tom. It doesn't work. Okay, let's move on. 
Ben, I'm going to turn it over to you from here. Okay. Well, as as Josh said, a little background on Kemper Sports. Uh, been in the business over 43 years. Have roughly 6,000 staff people. We basically at any of our courses, the entire team on site are Kemper Sports employees. Uh, 24 states, you know, 120 plus facilities. But we really view these as local businesses. They have their own golf courses, their own dynamics. Uh, what works in Wichita may or may not work in California. But what we do is we take best practices from all the things we learn at all the courses and redirect them back to the facilities that we manage. And it's really a way to consistently improve as we as we see trends develop throughout the country and take advantage of that national scope. As Josh mentioned, we uh, manage over 35 uh, municipal courses with 35 municipal partners with 45 courses really from coast to coast and have extensive experience uh, on the municipal side uh, and also with multi-course uh, facilities. And let's see, our video won't work either, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, <laughs> To give you a little uh, sort of idea of how Kemper Sports is organized and what we feel like we bring to the table as a national company, we operate with uh, both national and regional experts in each of these disciplines on the left. So we have national and regional sales and marketing people, agronomy, food and beverage, finance and accounting, HR, pro shop merchandising, our buying power, and even in construction and CapEx. And so what a client uh, gets when they hire Kemper Sports is access to all these experts and what individual courses and the Golf Wichita portfolio, the way it works is uh, we have what we call a regional operations executive. They're sort of the quarterback and they have the ability to call in each of these experts to help the local teams on an as needed basis. Uh, in almost all cases, we tend to start with the sales and marketing, agronomy and food and beverage because those are the items that uh, seem to uh, where we want to focus on first, but the other the other items are equally important. And I think that that scale and that size is what a company like ours brings to the table. And yet, you know, this this is brought to a local business, and so you sort of get the uh, the best of both worlds. Uh, just a little snapshot of the of the team. I could probably have uh, six more pictures on this slide. As was mentioned earlier, Alan will be a big part of the team in transitioning the junior golf. Uh, Mark Hosing, Steve Loomis, and Val D'Souza are each operational VPs. They have a lot of a lot of experience in transition. We transition usually about six to eight properties a year, so we have a pretty fine-tuned machine and way to do this. Annie Carey will be our sales and marketing regional. Uh, executive and and help uh, on that transition. And Heather and her team, she's the SVP of HR. She has a number of people behind her that will come on site as we transition um, the staff and do the training and all the things that go into that. Also, you know, I could put up the F and B team, the agronomy team, et cetera. But again, a country a company of our scale, the resources we can bring to the table to make these transitions uh, is is pretty impressive. As you'd expect from a company like ours, we've also, over the last 40 years, developed our own proprietary programs. And really the cornerstone in our programs from, from our perspective is our customer service program called True Service. And this is more an attitudinal program. This is more about creating a culture at the site uh, as opposed to just a, a sort of operating execute, executional program. We do this with a series of online learning and uh, four or five videos and modules, and every employee goes through this program every year at every course. That sounds pretty amazing, but with technology today, we can do this online. And what it does, it not only creates a great service uh, model and a great service atmosphere, but what we found is the staff likes it because it also lets them know what we expect of them and what the culture is and the services that are expected of them. So it's it's really a, a three-way win between us, our staff, and the customers. To follow that up, we have what's called true review, which after you finish your round, 
you'll get a survey online. It's just five questions, not one of those, you know, 50 question surveys. And what we find in this is we, it gives us the opportunity to really stay on top of what's going on at each golf course and entire company. Every Monday, every senior executive in this company gets a scorecard of how every course did. And then you can drill down um, into each individual course, both in terms of their rating, but more importantly, we have a separate exhibit that actually shows the uh, customer name, email, phone number, and uh, comment they might have, both positive and negative. And we really follow this closely because not only do we ask our people to follow up quickly, but make sure that the any kind of issue or problem is addressed immediately. And so this is sort of a circular program, if you think about it. We start with customer service, we get their input, and we go back to customer service again. We're very proud of these programs and have found it really enables us to deliver a level of consistency uh, throughout our network and especially at the site level. Uh, as you'd expect, we have a significant buying power as a policy. We pass that buying power on to our clients. So City of Wachita and the Park District would get the, uh, this buying advantage. Um, we have, of course, as you would expect, expense and revenue uh, systems in place, both to, uh, on the revenue side and point of sale side to capture customer information, but as well as a check and balance on the expense side. Another program we have that uh, is throughout the company is what we call Green to a T, which is in our environmental stewardship program. It's in four modules, and it starts out with what you would expect, recycling some of the basics of the environmental programs, but it, it quickly ramps up to a very sophisticated environmental program that we found our clients uh, especially in today's, you know, in today's times, mm -hmm. are much more sensitive to making sure these golf courses are env environmentally sound and have environmental programs and strategies uh, ongoing. At we all. also have a program <laughs> called, called Safety National. Uh, this again, it, while it says workplace safety, it's also for our customers. It's it's pretty amazing. Uh, we identify the uh -huh. issues on site and address them. And it's led to a significant reduction in our workman's comp claims and workman's comp cost. And then lastly, we have three programs for the team and for the staff members, Center of Excellence, which is a sort of internal uh, website that uh, all of our team members can go to and, and reference and access virtually anything in the company. It's really a, a sort of best practices environment standard operating procedures, and then, of course, a whole general manager training program. So all of these programs are really designed uh, to not only help the team, but to deliver a level of consistency. And again, it's part of what we deliver as part of our management fee and why uh, clients tend to hire uh, Kemper Sports. So the question becomes, how will we deliver on on the numbers uh, that were, have been shown. I think first and foremost, uh, you know, we believe that sales and marketing is really one of the keys to the golf industry. If you think about it, these are relatively fixed cost businesses to operate. You've got to mow the grass, you've got to have people, you've got to turn on the lights, whether you have one golfer or, you know, 100,000. And so what it really, uh, our task is to come up with creative uh, and aggressive and proven and new sales and marketing strategies and tactics. And that's what we'll be bringing to uh, Wichita. And, you know, much of that is is not only best practices that we've learned elsewhere, but also things that have worked in Wichita in the past, and we would expand them and improve them. Um, as we've talked about, you know, we're really in the repeat customer business, if you think about it. Certainly, we, we want to grow new customers, and that's what the junior golf program is all about. But, you know, there's a lot of adults out there that want to get better and want to improve their game. And through our surveying, no surprise, uh, you know, if you play better, you tend to like the game better. And if you like the game better, you tend to come back and play again. So uh, it's up to us to create that environment, not only in a, from a lesson standpoint, but from a programming standpoint as well. Uh, we want to improve course conditions. I think this this uh, three words never ends. We always uh, have a quest to try to get better at things and for the course to be good. If you, if you think about it, it's it's our product. I mean, we we deliver great service and we really want to have a good attitude, but ultimately people come and play the courses and expect 
uh, very good course conditions, and we would we expect the same thing. And if we don't deliver them, we hear them in our survey program. Um, one of the opportunities we believe uh, exists at the Wichita uh, at Golf Wichita is really to enhance and expand the food and beverage offerings uh, from where they are today. We think there's a lot of opportunity there, not only to expand the menus, but also uh, to to grow. And I'll talk about this to grow the outing business. We believe that that's an area that uh, can both, as Mark said, drive significant margins as well as uh, add money to the other uh, categories in pro shop and food and beverage. So we've had a lot of success with our golf outing business, and it's one of those uh, categories that's really key to driving the revenue side of the, of the business and growing, growing the margins. As I've said before, we want to improve customer service, and we intend to do so. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, we're all about our staff. They really are the ones that make it happen. It's been amazing. <laughs> it's been an amazing year with COVID, uh, and our staff has really, really risen to the occasion. And you find that you're only as good as, as your team. So uh, we have programs in place, and our HR team is really – uh, set up to try to attract, train, and supervise a quality staff. And then finally, you know, we all uh, are in, in businesses or, or frequent businesses, and the ones we like are the ones that truly focus on the customer and, and try to deliver a quality pro product for uh, uh, the right price and, and get the customers to come back. So we believe our programs and our survey programs and our true service programs, you know, all put together are, are focused on the customer and we found that in fact they work. Um, as I said earlier, you know, sales and marketing is key. As we all know, sales and marketing has evolved and changed significantly over the last 10 years with technology. Um, we use extensively social media, email and website marketing. Why? Because it can be much more targeted to each customer segment and why they play and what they're willing to pay. And it, those individual segments, not only can they be targeted, but they can have their own message. And so it's a very efficient way to target various customers uh, versus just running an ad in the newspaper. And it's very much, much more cost effective. So with search engine optimization and using Facebook or Twitter or, or Instagram, we've had a lot of success in this space. And, and as, you know, what we'd like to say is this to, is to help grow an already active program. The program at Wichita is, is very good. They've really done a nice job. Shannon's done a nice job. And we're here just to help and to grow that. And we've learned, you know, we've got some things we've learned at other courses. So I think it's one of those things that we can add on to something that's already uh, very good. Um, when we came on site, if, I guess a few months ago, one of the things uh, we did was a pretty extensive due diligence uh, program. You know, one of the things is, okay, if we, when we generate additional money, can those funds go back into course improvements, uh, and what might that look like? And as, uh, the first thing is that you know, we would want to establish a little bit more structured agronomic programs. Uh, Mark said, uh, you know, the city likes to measure things. We do, too. So uh, this is all done through the budget process, and we all agree on a game plan, and we all agree on expectations and what spending certain amount of dollars, what kind of product we expect. So all that is documented and then reviewed and improved, and it's a process year over year. One thing that's clear is there needs to be a, a pretty extensive equipment replacement program. That's one area that uh, really needs the initial focus, uh, largely because the equipment is is uh, old and outdated and in many cases not functioning. And so um, that would be something that we would recommend. And again, using our buying power, we believe we can bring significant savings to the to the city to get more equipment for less money. Um, you know, McDonald has been uh, probably of the four courses, the one that struggled the most from a turf condition standpoint. This can be somewhat or almost directly related to the lake situation. Everybody's pretty much probably aware that, you know, there's uh, some, some situation with 
uh, seepage and, and some of the weirs uh, have, have issues. And so that will need to be addressed immediately. And if we can capture more water, we believe we can improve turf conditions. Um, also, just sort of clean up and mow the secondary rough areas around the lakes. I think over time they've been they've been let uh, able to grow a little bit. We'd like to see that cleaned up a little bit and you know, remove dead trees. Just in general, clean up uh, and you know get the golf courses looking, especially in the out of play areas, a little bit uh, cleaner. Um, as mentioned earlier, not only is is uh, our golf lessons key, but programming which is a much broader um, uh, word and scope here is, is really what it's all about for growth. Obviously, we're going to have player development programs for adults and juniors, but beyond that, it's community engagement, it's leagues, it's we want to work with the Parks and Rec Department on any kind of golf programs. They want to, uh, us to work with them. Uh, family golf rates, as, as uh, Tom mentioned, kids play free. You know, all these programs, Mid Ladies Days program, this creates activity, it creates interest, it creates people to come back to the golf course. It creates, if the, you know, we always say if the junior likes it, then the mother tends to like it. If the mother tends to like it, the dad tends to like it. So you capture the whole family with this programming, and uh, that's the way that you really grow the business and the rounds and the revenue. Uh, as Mark showed, this is more of sort of a headliner. Uh, these numbers are essentially uh, about or the same as his. You know, we've added our management fees, and so roughly, you know, we're expecting about five, a little less than five hundred thousand uh, dollars to be used for hopefully equipment and capital improvements and whatever um, you know the board decides is the prudent way to spend uh, any excess funds. So, how would this work if we're hired? Um, you know, staff transition, as I mentioned earlier, all the staff becomes Kemper sports staff. Uh, we've had a lot of success, uh, as you, as I mentioned earlier, we've, you know, we have 35 clients, 45 municipal golf courses. This has been the model, and quite frankly, it's been very successful. Uh, we seem to find that the staff, uh, after we make the transition, is is quite happy and and it, we get a very positive response on this. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we have a whole team that comes in on the staff transition. This is a big deal to us. Uh, and, you know, HR and, and pay and, and all those kind of things is uh, near and dear to everybody's heart. So we make sure that that area is completely buttoned up and we have in-house uh, meetings and really answer everybody's questions and, and are, are used to doing these kind of large transitions. Uh, in terms of pay rates, you know, we view the industry, we've got a lot of data on pay rates, both regionally, locally, nationally, and, and that's what we would, uh, that's how we built the budgets here. We're giving everybody a 60-day trial period uh, should they want to join the team, and in almost all cases, you know, everybody draws joins the team at this initial phase, but that'll be left up to the individual people. Um, we are working with the city on a few long-term city employees that uh, that have been at the courses a long time, and that's that's going to be taken into consideration, and we'll work on a person by person basis on that. And then, um, you know, all full-time employees are eligible for our health and benefits programs. We have three levels of insurance both in terms of cost and coverage. And we wanted to offer something at the entry level that, you know, is quite affordable all the way up to the, the uh, you know, the, the full insurance that a family would, would expect and want. So again, a company of our size has a lot of options and a lot of resources that are available uh, to the team and to, uh, and to the city. In terms of sort of organization, uh, you know, at the top would be, clearly be the city of Wichita and the Parks and Rec Board. Um, we basically, if, sort of on the left is the operating side, uh, Kemper Sports. We work off, as I said earlier, a regional team and then a local team. You've got First Tee um, Greater Wichita, which will run the junior golf program at all the courses and will be actively involved in, in and have dialogue with both Kemper Sports directly and the advisory committee, advisory committee interacting with our local Wichita team. And so 
we believe this is, you know, the best way to sort of organize. It keeps everybody in the loop, um, and it's it also also uh, designates responsibility and and this is the way that we envision the organization organization chart uh, looking and working. So, in sort of closing, some of the key goals for First Tee and Kepper Sports. One, of course, is to improve financial performance. That uh, takes a uh, that solves a lot of problems and also helps fund both the operations and the capital improvements and the equipment. Maintain quality course conditions. This is key. This is something we believe in strongly. Um, you know, you can't run a business with lousy course conditions. It's as simple as that. So that's a high priority for us. Um, within that, within that, we have to manage costs efficiently and effectively. That's any business has to do that today. Um, we will be actively involved both in recommending and overseeing the capital improvements. There's quite a bit to do over the next number of years, and we have a lot of experience on the construction side and the capital improvement side. We believe that brings a lot of value to the table as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we believe strongly in the environmental side and, and want to continue the environmental stewardship uh, of the courses on behalf of the city and, and the and the um, you know the, everybody within the city and within the program. Uh, be accountable to all constituents. I mean, let's face it, uh, this is uh, this is a new structure, and we're not only accountable to the city, but we're accountable to the golfers and the and uh, the residents and you know all the people that are involved in the program. So we we like accountability and we have no pr problem uh, uh, tracking results and, and being accountable. Uh, we believe it's important to have and, and believe we will be able to deliver a high quality golf portfolio that the city can and the residents and the golfers can be proud of. And we think that that's sort of an overall goal here is uh, to upgrade everything from the courses to the quality to the capital improvements. We're doing all this to really try to achieve this goal. And then, you know, ultimately deliver professional friendly customer service. We're, as I said earlier, we're in the repeat customer business. We need to get them to come back. We need them, them to bring their friends. And so uh, within all of that, it's still about the customer and making sure that we deliver on our promise. And why is the first T Kemper Sports Partnership sort of right for this deal? I mean, there was a question about how did we really sort of get here? Well, the way we view it is, you know, the first T brings to the table the local market knowledge and relationships, the know, know everybody, know how the city works, know how the golf works in Wichita. That's very important to us. As I said earlier, these are local businesses. While we have national scope, we very much believe these are local businesses and local courses with their own dynamics and their own um, needs. And, and so we are very sensitive to the local uh, relationships. Clearly, the first team will bring a huge uh, benefit on the junior golf side, uh, and they will be responsible for the programs at each of our courses and not only organizing the programs, but executing the programs will certainly help, but uh, that's going to be their responsibility. And we see them a bit of a liaison between all in parties involved. I think great communication between all, all the parties involved, including the customers, uh, is a win-win for everybody. And we look to the first tee to help us uh, with, with that communication and making sure that we're meeting everybody's needs. And in terms of Kemper Sports, you know, I've basically uh, tried to summarize it in the last few slides, 43 years of experience managing a lot of golf courses. We've learned a lot. We've, uh, you know, like everybody else, you learn from your mistakes, and we think we're getting better and better. We do have a local, regional, and national support network, so that's that's how these management companies have grown and gotten to be so successful. It's the resources they bring to the table. As I said, we believe this is a sales and marketing game. You know, we we assume we know how to run these golf courses and we'll deliver great golf courses, but we need to sell and we need to have a sales and marketing effort that that uh, that really can drive the rounds and the revenue. Uh, and ultimately, you know, to 
mobilize and transition quickly. We're already into the season. Um, and so this is going to be one of those uh, situations that if, in fact, we are hired, uh, this is something that's going to have to, have to ha happen quickly. But it seems like we do that all the time. So that doesn't, uh, doesn't bother us at all. And we are really uh, prepared to do that. And then finally, I think why we've hit it off with the first T from the very first meeting is our shared values and beliefs. We're, you know, we're golf people. We all started as junior golfers. We all, a lot of us started municipal golf courses. I think there's a love for the game and a belief in the game that we all want to give back. You know, we all want to make sure that we leave uh, the Wichita golf courses better than we found them. And we believe that there's an opportunity here to get better and to solve, you know, the challenge of how do you generate enough profitability to not only pay the operations, but more importantly, to upgrade the courses and the equipment. And I think that's really the goal here is to to see if we can make this self-sustaining and and uh, for many years to come. So that's that's it in a nutshell. Hopefully it wasn't too long and uh, we're. We're, I'm going to turn it back over to Tom to sort of be the MC for Q&A. Well, thanks, Ben, and I hope we didn't put anybody to sleep. We've been working on this project for many, many months, and hopefully we feel like we've got it targeted that to make it a real success. So with that, I think I'll maybe just turn it over to Eddie and let you start in with questions and such. Well, yeah, first off, I want to thank, uh, you know, Alan and, and Tom, Ben and Josh for, for being here and, and giving this remarkable proposal. It seems like, um, you know, every concern that I had, you, you guys made it a point to uh, to hit on that at least once throughout the presentation. So it's almost like there's some communication there that uh, is much needed. So kudos to you guys. Uh, first question I have is, uh, you guys are are still managing uh, Sand Creek up there in Newton, correct? Correct. So I've played probably hundreds of tournaments and and rounds up there, um, and and I must say you guys do a tremendous job from operations and, and staffing and management all the way down to the agronomy. Um, it's always in tip top shape. I know you guys get a lot of rounds out there. Um, which can be evident at times with the pitch marks on the green, but it, they always roll really smooth and, and quick, which I like. Um, so kudos to you guys on that. Um, so with that, um, I will open it up. I've already got two hands. So uh, first order of business, if, if you guys do have a question, please uh, use your raise your hand feature, which is located at the top of your control bar there. So we'll start with Dale and uh, we'll go down the list to Hoyt and Richard after that. Go ahead, Dale. Okay, first of all, I wanna, nothing in this conversation should be negative about First Tee or Kemper. First Tee is a great program. Tom's done a wonderful job making it a viable program in Wichita. Kemper is an exemplary company. We know that from, as Eddie said, from Sand Creek. That aside, you are torturing us. This is eight months in, it's April 1st. We don't have a contract. We don't know what the contract is. We don't know, don't know what the specifics are. We keep waiting for something to actually report to them. <laughs> Dozens of people I see every day that ask what's the status and we don't know. Eddie just told me in a message that the manager has told him there is no contract yet. Um, at some point, uh, and right now the golf courses are frozen. The manager has put a hiring freeze on seasonal hiring. Mm -hmm. So there's like three people at each course trying to do the aeration and they're going to start mowing. Uh, there's a freeze on equipment purchases. There's a need for equipment to be uh, bought so these courses can remain functional. Otherwise, you guys are going to inherit a damaged system. We need to move forward at some point. And we are, I'm exasperated. I am, I, I start using some bad language here in a minute. We just need to know what's the, who's in charge. Who is the has the lease agreement with First Tee been finalized by the manager in First Tee? Will it require council approval? What is First Tee's reward for doing this? What does First Tee have as authority over this going forward? Lots of those operational questions. This has been a great infomercial. You guys are wonderful in what you do. You should be proud of what you do. But we need some specific answers at this point instead of uh, just continuing to lead us down this path without specifics. 
So just to clarify real quick, um, from what I took away from my conversation with with uh, manager Layton on Tuesday, there is a contract. However, it's not finalized. He's looking for some direction from from this group right now um, to move forward one way or the other. It, and I see Bob's hand up right now. I'll let him jump in and um, explain a little bit. City manager. Eddie, thank, thanks so much. I just thought I'd maybe pipe up here and so I can address the issue, not just the one that Dale brought up immediately, but what he had talked about previously. And I've talked to several golfers as well as members of the park board uh, about this process. Uh, let's go back for just a second. It was back in August of last year that we talked about exploring um, a, a lease arrangement with First T is a nonprofit, right? And that's not a, that's a very common model in parks and recreation. It's done with softball complexes, baseball complexes, soccer fields and soccer complexes, uh, even ice facilities. So it's not uncommon to enter into a partnership with a nonprofit uh, to operate a, a facility and to maintain it. So we wanted to explore that with First T and did that uh, through really through the fall and the winter. Got to a point where we were a little uncomfortable from a staff standpoint on a straight up lease arrangement because first T was going to bring in Kemper and we're very comfortable with that. And as, as you could see, they're very well qualified, but um, we didn't have a direct relationship. And in fact, uh, I, in talking to Dale and some other golfers, that was one of the concerns they had is that we didn't have a direct relationship with Kemper. So we then started we, and, and also, we weren't under that arrangement uh, of a straight up lease. We couldn't get the guarantees necessary to see money reinvested in the courses in a way that we needed uh, in terms of significant improvements over a number of years to uh, improve the, the quality of the courses. So we did a pivot, which was a really a three way agreement where we'd, we would be contracting with both First T and Kemper. And in that way, we would have a better idea about the actual finances of Kemper and also how the money would flow from revenue through expenditures down to the net profit and what would be returned to the city that could be used then for equipment purchases and course improvements. But I recognized that that was also a change in the process. And um, I promised to the park board early and I also told a number of golfers that are on this call that we would continue consult. And in that case, we were not comfortable going forward until the park board, the golf advisory committee and others had a chance to review it and say, yes, this looks like it's a great arrangement for the golf community and for the city. And let's go ahead and move forward. Or wait a minute, we have some questions or concerns about this approach and we'd like you to explore something different. Don't have a contract in front of you because I don't want to get ahead of you. If, there, if the consensus of the park board and the golf advisory committee after today's initial presentation is we need some more information or we want you to go in a different direction, then that's the guidance that we'll take. But um, there's nothing nefarious here. And at the same time, it would have been, I think, presumptuous of us to finish an agreement and bring it to you and, sh and say, OK, here we are at the last minute. Go ahead and approve this agreement. This is our only option. So we want to hear from you about where you want to go. Uh, Dale's right. I'm waiting to, to, on the staffing issue until I get some general direction from you. Either we do something in the interim or we have to do something to get us through 2021. You help us decide, but we're to the point now where we wanted to bring that forward. Thank you, Bob. Um, so before Eddie, I go. Eddie, the, could I just follow up? I, so the circumstance now is there will not be a lease arrangement of the courses to First Tee? Yes, that is correct. And Dale, we had talked about that in a, a meeting I had with you and a small group of golfers. We have we moved away from that arrangement uh, and partly because of feedback we had during this past year as we were working through the deal and it, because of some concerns we had about the lease arrangement. OK, so what is First T's managerial role in this model? So I can let First T address that um, or I can talk about it. Well, you're the one that's going to decide what it is. So what is their role and their authority? First T will be the coordinating uh, youth golf activities for the courses and making sure that we are better. We're better coordinated among the groups that are providing youth golf opportunities and that we have a structured program with Kemper to 
uh, provide instruction and time on the courses so that we develop the youth golf. Okay, that's good to hear. That's different than what we had been talked to about before. What is First Tee's reward for doing that in this contract circumstance? There was a, uh, in our earlier conversation with you, Bob, there was a talk about a donation being made by First Tee or by Kemper to First Tee. Is there a financial arrangement between First Tee and Kemper and the city? And what is that? First Tee will make um, a payment to, excuse me, Kemper, I believe, will make a payment out of its management fee to First Tee to do the coordination of youth golf on the courses. And I'll let them talk about how that arrangement would work. Okay, but the authority is, you have the authority for the contract. That still is vested with the city. It is, it's vested with the city. Okay, well, that's different, and that's, I appreciate that clarification. Yeah. Well, following up, uh, following up is why, why are we not doing an RFP uh, manager on bringing in other parties? I know there are at least two, I've talked to them, who are interested in this project as well and might offer a competing uh, scenario. Are we not following, why is this not a regular RFP? Uh, project. Dale, you've asked me that question before, and that's why we're here today, right? I, I needed to bring to this group how this project has evolved and why and that we're at a different point today than mm -hmm. we're, when we started back in August mm -hmm. of last year. And I need your guidance about the process you want us to follow. Are you comfortable with where we are or do you want to go in a different direction? So that, that's why we're having the workshop and then, of course, whatever other follow up uh, uh, meetings you want to have after that, if necessary. But my question is, why go through take first tee and camera yeah. this long process if the issue of the RFP has not yet been decided? Uh, it seems like you got the cart ahead of the horse here. If you do well, an RFP, we're going to be hearing this from everybody. Uh, that, why? That, but that's why we stopped, Dale. We, we okay. stopped because we didn't want to get the cart before the horse. I I told you before, and I've told many of you that in those discussions, we wanted to get to a point where we understood how we could do an arrangement with the first tee, and they brought Kemper into the arrangement. How could we do it in a way that is beneficial to the golf community and to the city as a whole? And the we got to this point negotiating with first tee and with Kemper, but I recognized it was a change in conditions from what we talked about before. And I'm not going to, we're not going to finalize an agreement with them or go any further down the road if the park board wants us to move in a different direction. All right, well, I'd suggest to Eddie that in process, I mean, this is great to hear all this information, but it's irrelevant if this isn't going to be the model we're using. If we're going to be listening to three other vendors down the road or whatever that uh, follows, perhaps this is a discussion the park board should engage at its next meeting to give the manager what he wants here, which is a uh, feedback on is this the right path or should we be doing something else? We've talked about the uh, suggestion of hitting the pause button. We're in good financial shape. We're operating at a good level right now and the need to jump into some drastic change may be uh, not quite as urgent as. So Eddie, I would just toss that out for your consideration as you lead us forward here. Well, let's lay out the options that we have on the table right now. So first would be uh, obviously what's right in front of us, um, you know, for this agreement with First no. T and for um, move forward with these guys and and again timing is is critical especially now um, you know you, you they hit on it um, you know they're ready to basically turn key and and they've got their staff and operations ready to go to take care of the the golf courses um, so the the punching of the greens um, you know what you need to do with the fairways and everything like that obviously we're in a hiring freeze and a um, little bit undermanned right now with the current model um, so that's that's option number one. Option number two is is to how you put it, Dale, hit the pause button and uh, start the RFP process, which is obviously a, a rather lengthy process. I think it's probably we're looking at at least three months. Um, so that takes us to probably August, um, and, and at that point we're looking at the 22 season. So we would have to get by with what we got now, um, hoping we can unfreeze the 
the hiring situation um, and uh, and just deal with deal with the golf courses for for one more season and then go through an RFP process for the 22 season. So to me, those are the two options on the table, the two most viable options on the table at the at the present moment. Clearly, our model that we've used for the past however many years is flawed, and there are um, significant changes that need to be made if we are to be sustainable. Uh, perhaps so, a, a third option, Eddie, to put on that list is to continue the operation of the Wichita Golf Division with an internal hire, hiring a division manager that is uh, displayed success in marketing and in uh, and in operation of golf courses and take a look at that along with the option of an RFP and simply just doing what we are now. Uh, uh, so you ahead. want to, you want to hire somebody, um, you know, and basically Troy Henders role. Uh, you want to hire somebody and then go out to RFP three months later. Well, there would have to be a decision made by the city as to a commitment. Really, you'd have to commit to a internal solution with that hire because nobody's going to take the job if you think you're going to go to an rfp six months later obviously that's Correct. a policy policy question that the park board in coordination with the golf advisory committee and the council ultimately needs to address but that's the fundamental question here about what direction we go mr layton uh question for you first how long have you been uh with the city of wichita uh 12 years how long have we operated the golf fund under this same model? Uh, we've operated for 12 years the same way. Okay. Would you say it's flawed? Or or would you say it needs some upgrades? I, I would not have started the process if I didn't think there was a better way for us to operate. And, if, and, um, and I was convinced that we were not going to do it um, by just continuing and, and playing around the edges with our current approach. The more we talked to Kemper about the way they manage, the more I realized that private operations of courses like this and public operations can be really night and day. And the things that they're doing to drive revenue, the places where they spend money, all make sense in terms of generating additional rounds and additional golfers. Um, so, and then the partnership with First Tee, of course, then makes sure that we're trying to make this a sustainable sport. And so, I the deeper we got into this, the more I thought that it was in the best interest of the community to have a private operator uh, ma uh, managing our courses. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Um, Hoyt, I see your hand up. You're next on the list. Why, thank you. Almost forgot what I wanted to say. Uh, <laughs> you know, it seems to me like First T needs the capital to build their building to uh, to train people. This is uh, simply one solution for them, and it's creating uh, a lot of convoluted concern for the entire golf courses. Uh, just so they could have a better building for their kids. Uh, I, I think we're, uh, we're looking at it the wrong way. My question would be, what uh, have the uh, golf pros said about this, and, or have you even presented it to them? Eddie, can I respond to Hoyt real quick? Yes, sir. Yeah, Hoyt. Um, we have never had any discussions, nor has there been any thoughts that this was going to benefit First Tee and a, having a bigger, better building. Um, First Tee is a nonprofit which requires a consistent cash flow year after year. And currently, we get that 100% from private donors, both corporations and individuals, and occasionally from, from uh, grants from other uh, foundations. And it's always a, a uh, necessity for any nonprofit to find other revenue streams. Um, 
this, when we were approached with this idea in the very beginning, and when I began to think through the benefits or the negatives to doing this, there was certainly a benefit if we could structure it properly where First Tee would, would generate some funds, some revenue. And uh, so, and that's the case with the current structure that we presented today. But by no means does it have anything to do with us having a fancier building or any of that stuff. It's being able to sustain our programs. Tom, can um, I can add to that? Can I add to that? Um, you know, from our perspective, the first T are going to provide significant services in managing the junior programs at each of the courses. As Tom pointed out to me, they have to sign kids up. They have to have people there to check them in. They have to have supervision. They have costs against the, the fees that they're going to earn. And so, you know, in my mind, uh, they're providing a definitely needed service that's going to help us over help everybody on this call. Um, and they're going to have costs associated with that. And so therefore, uh, they're going to participate in, in the fees uh, with us. Uh, what do the uh, what do the golf pros think about it? At our current courses. Oops, I'm not really sure how you're asking that question, White. Um, when we've been working with First Tee quite a bit already, uh, they've actually have programs in each one of our golf courses. We've been working with First Tee very closely on recruiting uh, junior golfers to our system. Uh, so we've been working hand in hand with First Tee the past no, two I'm, years. I'm, I'm talking about the Kemper process. I uh, have has the. Uh, thought of bringing uh, a Kemper like program uh, to the uh, golf pros uh, been introduced. I think the marketing and all the other things they do are absolutely fabulous. I like what they're doing, but I'd still like to know uh, what the uh, if the staff has has been aware and and seen this program. So they've definitely been aware of the process. We've been sharing uh, each one of these steps as we go through, but probably today is probably the most information that we've had, and we wanted to make sure that get that information out to you guys. Uh, I've been also sharing some of these items with the golf pros. So, um, uh, so they're not present today. I see several of them on the call. Many of them are oh, actually are they? on the call. Yeah, okay. when we asked them to be on the call, several of them Good. invited them, asked to be invited, and so. Uh, and, and I think they've been on past meetings as well, and they've actually started being being involved with the uh, golf advisory committee meetings as well. So well, you can see that, 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 that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. So Troy, a little bit of a follow up there. Are they are they and the rest of the staff, current staff, I should say, comfortable with this? Um, proposal slash arrangement? Well, anytime there's change, I think there's going to be cause for concern. I think they really have uh, obviously a vested interest in their job and, and uh, benefits. So I've been sharing with them what I do know, and there is a commitment from uh, Kemper and to, to hire as many of these folks as possible. And they want to share their benefit packages with them as well. So it's definitely a change in the model. Um, I can't speak exactly what it's going to be uh, dollar for dollar and person per person, uh, but I do feel pretty confident that uh, First T, at, I'm sorry, Kemper is going to take care of them. Um, so, I, and I share that with the staff as well. Yeah, I think that's absolutely crucial that we take care of our current staff um, for many reasons. Uh, make sure that they're comfortable with this. Yeah, you know, we had this conversation. Um, and from the very beginning, I was a little concerned about this, but knowing that there is a commitment to hire our staff on with the Kemper team, and hopefully they uh, would, would do very well, uh, they would. And in fact, I think Kemper really will need the staff to be successful because um, the staff already knows all the operations, they know the equipment, they know the needs. So uh, they're definitely going to be needing that staff to be successful. 
they certainly have the uh, local knowledge, if you will. Um, but adding somebody like Kemper obviously brings some increased efficiencies and in marketing and operations and other things. So um, we, if we agree with all the comments. Look, you know, when we come in to any situation, um, we come in with a, a welcoming attitude. We want the people. <laughs> As you said, they know the operations backwards and forwards. Uh, we're here to try to make things better. Uh, you know, we we really believe we offer all of our programs that will eventually hopefully help their careers and help their learning path and their earning path. So um, we have seldom, if ever I can remember, not had a positive situation when we come in and transition the staff. And, and I think that they like, you know, that type of structure as well. So um, happy to talk to anyone. We really have not had the ability or really been, you know, in these kind of situations, it's not appropriate yet for us to talk to people. But when the appropriate time is, we're happy and would uh, very much welcome to talk to anyone. Understood. Ben, real quick question. I know you, you gave the stats on how many courses and, and staff members you guys have. Um, how many situations have you guys gone through like this where you come into a city organization and, and you're looking at um, not one, not two, not three, but four municipal golf courses with several people um, on staff. How many, how many um, situations have you have you come across like this? Uh, uh, many. I mean, uh, you know, probably specifically something like this. Let's call it ten situations or more. I mean, these are very similar situations when we come in. Um, and think about it. We do this in California, we do this in New York, and we do this in Florida. So in its own way, they're different environments, but they all seem to transition and work. And I think once the staff sees that we're committed and we're sincere and, and we don't have any hidden agenda here, we just want a better golf operation and we want to uh, have a better environment for both the staff and the, and the players, uh, you know, the transition becomes seamless, quite frankly. Thank you. <clears throat> um, next on the list is uh, Richard. Thank you. Um, um, one of the things that um, um, I still have a question on, and that is, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, when we come to the calculations on um, the income and uh, expense. Uh, I am assuming right now uh, the model and was uh, talked about earlier that the model that we have is based upon a, a membership system. Um, it's one that we borrowed from um, uh, a local um, uh, non-for-profit that um, has been very successful. Um, I assume that you've looked at our um, fees that we are charging for the memberships and um, if that is uh, not going to be carried over, and I'm assuming that you will institute your own um, uh, model, uh, can you tell me how much the um, the memberships are going to change? I assume you offer some memberships um, or passes, and um, how much of a hike um, the golfers will be paying um, uh, for the changeover. Thank you. Sure. The, the, the current plan and uh, the, the generation of the generating the pro forma, we anticipate keeping the membership uh, uh, in the same format and in the same price point it is today. Um, you know, certainly one of the things that's challenging and needs to be looked at is, you know, is it fair to the system and to really everyone um, if, you know, the lowest paying golfer is playing on Saturday morning, which is the highest demand tee time. And I think what we have to do, and we've talked about it internally, is come up with a system. There's four golf courses, so there's plenty of uh, uh, capacity to, to offer appropriate programs at certain courses and move it around throughout the year. But also, there has to be a, sort of an understanding that some of those peak times on the weekends and then on the holidays have to be for golfers that are willing to pay 
you know, the higher daily fee price. And we believe there's enough room for everybody to go around. And so there's no need to, in fact, the membership program has worked quite well. Um, so we would anticipate continuing that, but then to further define both the outing business and the other, um, the other uh, customer segments that are willing to play and pay a higher rate. So it's very on par, if you will, with um, you know the Scottsdale's, and when you go down to Florida, you see you see kind of a rolling rate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we call it customer segments, and they come to your golf course for different reasons and are willing to pay different rates based on on uh, you know the golf course itself. And let's face it, the other thing we're looking at is there are four different golf courses with four different, uh, very different uh, experiences and. Are there ways to maybe, uh, you know, do some pricing and things at, at the courses a little differently instead of one size fits all? So, you know, it's those kind of more sophisticated marketing programs and and uh, T-sheet sort of management that we look at that we, we uh, believe we could manage our way through this because, as you say, the existing membership program uh, has worked well. So why would you why would you throw that out the window? Sure. Thank you, Richard. Uh, next on the list is Niall. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Uh, I've got I got two questions, um, but so if you would allow me, I'm, I'll ask my two and then get off the air. But uh, first of all, um, in the presentation, um, the uh, indication was that uh, Camper would make recommendations as to capital improvements. Um, and currently, I believe, because when we talked uh, here a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, we got a, a wish list from the golf course uh, pros, and all of them had listed that uh, we need to upgrade and replace a lot of our maintenance, a lot of our equipment. Um, so my question on, on the equipment side is, uh, any re current reserves that we have, will those transfer over to Kemper, or does Kemper just simply say, Wichita, you need a bunch more mowers, um, and the city has to fund those? The second question is, uh, deals with um, staffing, and we, we do have a number of, of uh, folks that have been with the uh, uh, city of Wichita for quite a while and have built up um, retirement benefits. And I'm wondering what happens to those um, benefits. Do they, how, how are those treated uh, once these people are transitioned out of the city and, and over to Kemper? So those are my two questions. I don't know who is best at addressing them, but um, I'll lower my hand now and move on. Eddie, you want right. me to take a shot at the first one and then someone else can answer the second one? Please do. Okay. Um, well, let's maybe take a step back. The way the uh, management contract works is we make recommendations uh, based on our experience and expertise. Let's take let's take golf course equipment, and um, but those those recommendations are brought to the uh, to the city, and we price them and tell them why. But ultimately, it's the city is still in control of all the decision making here in terms of expenditures and what are priorities. Etc. Clearly, you're hiring us for our for our golf expertise and our experience, and um, we, you know we believe we're going to bring the correct uh, priority list to the city. But ultimately, uh, it will be their decision uh, what is what is how much is spent and where it's spent, and that's really how these kind of uh, arrangements work. So the city pays for it. Correct. So, yeah, and I'll let I'll, I'll let Bob or uh, Troy touch on that a little bit. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch it on that. And I think a lot of this is going to be coming from the expected revenues that we're going to be getting from the situation and the arrangement. We can use those dollars to do course improvements, improve on the equipment. Um, but I, I think we would still need to come up with a strategy, a long-term strategy to address many of these issues. But the, so the, the reason why we came up with this model, correct, Troy, um, 
you know, yes, the city would be paying for the mowers. However, we, uh, the city would then own those mowers, correct? That, that's correct. And we would also be using the revenues to put that back into the courses, whether it's equipment or whether it's course uh, uh, improvements as well. Okay. And we have received, yeah, if I could, Troy, we've received some recommendations, um, pretty tangible recommendations for the purchase of equipment. Uh, and I think, um, not put words in, in uh, Kemper's mouth, but I think they would recommend, similar to what our pros did or our staff did, that we replace a significant amount of our equipment in the first year and then also address capital needs at uh, McDonald, uh, especially as it pertains to the pond system. So those would be the priorities for uh, uh, early revenues coming back to us, as well as reserved funds that we have available right now in our system. So, yeah, that's... That Bob, that's built into the pricing um, uh, of the of what Kemper's going to be paying to the city to cover those kinds of you've, you, right. When we talk about a, a net profit back to the city or a net income back to the city, that's how we anticipate that. That's what I would recommend is how that money is to be spent. So okay, so that your pricing's already built in what you consider to be your your uh, capital improvement or your uh, equipment maintenance and right. replacement. Okay. Right. And, and Niall, if it's all right, I'd like to address your second question. That has to do with employees who have been with us for a period, a longer period of time and are concerned about getting some additional years of service in our system. Um, if they were to go to Kemper they would, and they're vested, then their benefits would be calculated on the years of service they had with us before they went to Kemper. If though they're concerned about uh, additional years of service, um, probably the one bright part of the pandemic was that we were forced to freeze over 500 positions in the organization. So I've made the commitment that we would look for permanent employment inside the organization for those employees that wanted to um, continue and uh, protect their retirement and actually add to their retirement and stay on with city employment. So they'll be presented with two options and that would be to, to move on in this under this scenario, they'd move either to Kemper or we would find a home for them in the city. And a reminder to those of you who've been around for a while, that's the same thing we did when park maintenance transitioned to a uh, contract basis. And so the, an employee who's, who's currently not vested, if they choose to go with uh, Kemper, will Kemper honor any of that? I mean, does just, just Kemper have a, a, a retirement plan, I guess? And will any of those benefits transfer over to Kemper? I mean, will the employee be able to take that what, what they've already earned in invest towards their um, their investment over to Kemper? Uh, the, the answer to the second part of your question is no, our benefits are not uh, uh, transferable or portable. Uh, they're, they're vested in our specific pension system. <clears throat> the Kemper does, have a, Kemper does have a retirement program that they could begin to participate in uh, once the, the employment is switched over. Okay, but so the any any years of, of, of that they've they've earned or any yeah okay I get it. yeah okay they'll just they'll just lose what they've earned so far. Okay, um, next on the list is uh, Michael Ward. Hey, thanks, Eddie. Um, and as you can see, I'm in my car. So, uh, you know, interesting to listen in for the last hour and a half driving. I, I appreciate uh, the Kemper group, uh, Ben and Josh. Um, good stuff. I mean, well, well prepared. Uh, makes sense from an organization as large as yours and, and some of the courses in the portfolio. Um, we talked a lot about, I, I'm just going to make a comment. I don't necessarily have a direct question. We've talked a lot about uh, Kemper itself. We've talked a lot about the city. We've talked about First Key's kind of intermediary relationship. I, I'm not super familiar with, uh, you know, the terms of what that looks like, but their, their position within all of this. Um, we mentioned no public comment here, and that probably makes sense. I don't know what that looks like on a broader scope somewhere down the road. 
but I do think it's important. Um, you, we, when I mentioned those three buckets, the fourth bucket is the users, is the the city populace, is the people who play out there. Uh, to Josh's point, is the people who grew up out there with their dads or their brothers or whoever it may be. Um, so, I, you know, that gets a lot harder in this day and age, uh, but I do still think it's valid. Um, and, and, you know, the pros, uh, I think a lot of times they don't voice their concerns because the, in the current system, they're relatively handcuffed anyway. So um, not just from, you know, from a city standpoint and that relationship standpoint, but, you know, their thoughts on the on the future trajectory of the four courses themselves as people who've been involved with them for 25, 35, 45 years, whatever it may be. So, uh, again, Kemper, thanks for coming on. Good stuff. Uh, obviously, a lot. Of, thanks for hanging in there through a lot of uh, local related questions. Kind of gets micro versus uh, your guys' viewpoint, but um, just just a comment from my end more than anything, and appreciate everybody's time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Michael. Um, obviously, the <clears throat> ultimately the golfers are, are who we want to uh, you know make happy here. Um, I thought they did a first tee and Kipper did a nice job in their uh, proposal um, addressing that, um, having ways to to scale that. Um, and certainly there will be um, you know opportunities down the road um, to voice their their opinions uh, one way or the other. Um, but out of respect for everybody's time uh, tonight, um, I believe this is just a introductory workshop. Um, so again, uh, you know, the public will be engaged. We'll have an opportunity to engage uh, further on down the road. So, thank you both for those comments about Kemper Sports. Really appreciate it. And you know, we, for the staff that's on or the the pros that are on, you know, we um, we really look forward to working with them. And as you said, maybe they feel handcuffed now or aren't being heard. I, you know, that's the kind of thing we hope to change because our model is, you know, every one of these is local and no one knows it better than than those people. And so we, we try and not only listen to them, but as Ben was going through some of our proprietary programs, we really do give a voice to the golfers uh, through our true review program. Everyone has a chance. Anyone who plays one of our courses has a chance to fill out the survey. And I can tell you, having been a general manager personally of several of our properties, we take those we take the customer feedback very seriously. In fact, have a weekly meeting and go over all the comments and look for trends, look for statistic trends in the customer comments. So we we hope that both the staff and the customers will feel more heard uh, working for an organization like ours. Thanks, Josh. Um, next on the list is Alejo Cabral. Uh, thank you, Eddie, and, and thank you, everybody, who's been uh, sharing today. But um, for our our, uh, our friends at Kemper Sports, um, would you be able to provide some examples of communities where you have transitioned four courses, you know, where you've gone into a similar transition as where you're going with now? Um, and then... Um, I'd love to uh, better understand, you know, what that relationship has looked like with with the public, because I'm sure you're seeing you're seeing now, but we're really passionate about our golf courses and uh, we want to ensure that our golfers have access to and our community as a whole has access to uh, uh, to affordable uh, golf and in uh, in exceptional facilities. And so, um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, sure. I mean, we welcome, look, uh, we would expect somebody like you do in any job interview is call our references, so to speak. And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, at the appropriate time, uh, not only reach out to the, to select customers, but our clients. And um, uh, we're quite proud of, of the ability to come in and, uh, you know, what appears to be a pretty complicated situation. Um come in and be able to transition and assimilate into the culture and the community. Um, you know, we're, we, we believe strongly as Josh just said in the local community and being a part of that. So, um, uh, we will come up with examples. Uh, that's not a problem. I think in your presentation, you listed 35 municipalities that we work with and some of them may have been built where we help them take the, 
the golf courses out of the ground and built them and they were new construction. But many of them were situations just like this where we came in and uh, partnered with the city or county or park district to take over management. And, yeah, and were they of this were they systems of this size? I mean, because Wichita is really unique, I think, in that respect that we have four and a one point five courses. Yeah, I, well, yes, and we can also look at, it, at revenue size as well, and we've done it with a whole lot more revenue and and sometimes less revenue. But yeah, we've managed from the Chicago Park District and other big, you know, Chicago Park District has eight facilities which we've taken over and transitioned at least once in our history and um and several other cities which benny you know, listed in the presentation yeah we even uh, two things we uh, about a year ago someone asked you know one of our meetings how what's our average tenure at uh, our municipal courses and we looked at it and, and sort of figured it out it's over 11 years is uh, you know so on average and growing and continuing at our at our with our municipal clients. So uh, look, we believe strongly we want to be there long term, and the only way that you're there long term is to deliver results. And that's not only results for the city, but that's results for the golfers. And the golfers measure you by satisfaction and the course conditions and how they're treated. So um, you know we're we're pretty proud of of our track record, and we'll definitely be able to. Uh, connect whomever with the right people. Yeah, no, I'd love to see those courses and, and learn more about what that experience has looked like. Yeah. We, we have one in New Jersey that gave us their hockey rink. So that's, we managed, <laughs> we managed three golf courses in a hockey rink. So that sort of uh, uh, gives you an idea where we're, we're pretty flexible. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Ty Taming. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I, I serve on the park board and, uh, you know, we talk about golf uh, a great deal. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm just sort of wrestling with the challenge of figuring out how do we know we're getting the best deal possible? Um, you know, we're, we're looking at paying $75,000 per course um, for $300,000 a year. Um, I guess I would ask Kemper for for those of us who really aren't golfers and want to better understand the uh, the finances. Um, you know, can you put that in context to maybe some other courses where you've where you've operated? Um, I'd, I'd be um, interested in sort of better understanding how you reach the seventy five thousand dollars number. And then and then my question of the city, um, you know, goes back to process. Um, you know, it was a year ago or two years ago, there was an unsolicited bid for someone to purchase one of the courts, uh, one of the courses, and that triggered an RFP process. Uh, I understand this is management and it's not the conveyance of property, but I heard from someone that since this is a nonprofit, that didn't trigger uh, an RFP process. So is it an own versus manage? Is it the involvement of a nonprofit? Um, maybe the city can inform the rest of us on exactly what triggers an RFP process because several of us feel like um, one should have been undertaken to, to get to the point that we're at today. Um, I'll take a shot at the at the fee question. Um, you know, our, our fees range uh, de depending on the course and the situation and and the scope of services that we're being asked to to deliver. Uh, for a single course, it's usually anywhere from we would quote 84 to 120,000 per course. Um, and that's, as I said, there's so many variables in, in our price quote. Um, how we arrived at this number was a combination of the amount of revenues that we think we can generate, the scope of work, the amount of work that we're going to have to perform. You know, it's a little bit of an art and a little bit of science but uh, and the fact that it's multiple courses you know you should get a little bit better price so we think that the that the price point is, is fair to both parties and is a reflection of the amount of work that we're going to have to put in and we'll want to put in over time um, you know to make this a win-win for everybody
And if Bob or Troy want to hop in to, to take a stab at the second question there um, about the RFP. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll try to build on what I had said before, I, and it's probably a little bit of a repeat. Um, when we started the process as a lease arrangement with, with uh, First Tee as a nonprofit, that, that's a pretty common arrangement. It's not doesn't normally involve a solicitation of proposals or, or bids. You you work with the group that's uh, involved with you know that's actually a user group. Um, the reason we're here today is because we recognize that we we pivoted from that, and so we will be partnering and um, uh, under contract with a nonprofit. But in order to make sure we have accountability, we would also be. Uh, 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 under contract with the private firm Kemper, so it's a three-way agreement, and um, it, his, uh, that it did it evolved over time, and that's why we're here today to to tell you, here's the deal as it has developed. You need to let us know regarding uh, process if that's appropriate, something you're comfortable with. We wanted you to hear the business aspects um, and why we thought that this had evolved into something that's beneficial. But um, again, Ty, that's the best I can do in terms of saying how we got to this point. Um, and um, uh, be glad to answer any qu other questions regarding that. So I, if I may just dovetail off that a touch from a golfer's perspective, and I'm not buying for or against this, but the timing is a, is a big deal as well, uh, Ty. Um, you know, as I said earlier, this is one of the most crucial times in the season to prepare your golf courses for the summer months um, where they will be seeing the most traction and, and play um, to get everything organized and in place and make sure you aerate the greens properly and, and everything like that, that they need to um, basically a turnkey process. Um, so that that might be another reason why um, the RFP process may not be appropriate. Um, and. <laughs> I guess you can come back with, well, if they've been working on this for X amount of months, why didn't we start that process a while back? Um, but again, I'm not buying for or against it. That's just from a golfer's perspective um, in terms of timing. Did that answer your question, Ty? Yeah, it did. Thank you. Okay. If there's no other questions, uh, I see Dale. Um, a couple that you can provide answers for in writing afterwards. Uh, uh, one is on the staff salary question. Ben, you in your presentation, you said you use an industry standard to identify the appropriate level of compensation. Would it be possible for you to compare that to what we are paying our staff at this point and provide that uh, going forward? I mean, you remember that in your presentation where you, you identified a standard and I would just like to know how that compares to what our current compensation levels are. You don't have to get into it now. Uh, if you can provide yeah. that later, that'd be fine. Um, second question, also you can provide this later. The membership issue that Richard alluded to, we have about 1,100 members right now who have been promised no green fees ever. That's a public relations issue you're going to have to. I'd like to know and do this in, in writing uh, as a follow-up as well. How will you handle that public relations problem with 1,100 people who have been promised no green fees ever going forward. You got to make that transition. And I am in fully a support of raising the amount of revenue we need. To, we, it's an absurd level right now. I'm playing golf for four bucks a round. So that all needs to change. All right, if you could provide that as a follow-up, do it, do it, do it now. Um, the issue of uh, operational models that was alluded to, um, I was going to ask you, Mr. Hendricks, our previous superintendent, his model was to put a PGA pro and a PGA assistant pro at every golf course. That was about a, um, I'm thinking 70,000 to $100,000 commitment of salaries at each golf course. That was our model the last dozen years. That's part of the reason that we're in the hole. I'm guessing your model is different. You can again provide that if you would in follow up information in writing. What is your staffing model at each clubhouse? Do you have a pro at each clubhouse? Do you have an assistant PGA pro at each clubhouse? And what are those compensation levels? Uh, we're paying about 40,000 for an assistant pro, uh, 50 to 60 for a, a, the PGA pro. So again, I don't need to take more time to have you answer it. I would like to see that in writing uh, going forward. 
lastly, the question about process on the membership thing again, if we change it, who's in charge here? I'm still lost on this. Uh, Bob said he made a pivot. I understand that. But who's in charge? Who 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 decides what the uh, what the membership fees might be? Will that still flow through the park board, the GAC, the council? Does does Kemper do that? Uh, that to me is a critical question that needs to be answered. Um, and lastly, uh, in regard to Ty's question about comparables, I've been in conversation with some other vendors. I know there are competitive offers that will drive your offer down. When you're when you're into the only game in town and you get to set the terms and you set a price, I understand that. But when you're competing with other entities and you know who they are, Ben, you know who they are, who are going to come in and say you're overpriced. I'd like to think that process evolves uh, through the park board, Eddie, uh, and, and perhaps at the next meeting that we look at. Um, we've had a wonderful explanation here, a wonderful infomercial about Camper. You're a great company but you're doing it in a vacuum with nobody else in the in the room. Uh, I'd like to see what it looks like when there are competitors in a free market. Uh, we're, we're an enterprise fund, which means we are a business driven model and needs to follow capitalistic free enterprise, free market models to make sure we're getting the best value for money. No disparagement to you folks. You've been great and you're a great company, but going forward, that's the direction I think we need to go. Again, if you could provide that information in writing, uh, after this meeting, that'd be great. Can you send me all those questions uh, so I make sure I don't miss anything, please? Well, you, should, you should write faster, Ben. My God. <laughs> <laughs> I will, Ben. I will. I will send that to Mr. Hausman and let him uh, um, bring those forward. It would be useful to have that information at the next park board meeting, which I think is in about a week and a half. Eddie, I'm assuming this issue goes to that agenda at this point. I haven't had the uh, the agenda meeting quite yet, but um, I'm sure it will be a topic of discussion. Okay. All right, and that and I appreciate your and Ben and, and Josh, you are a great company. I love playing Sand Creek. One question, Eddie was getting close to that. Uh, there's a, been asked about how do you manage two competing golf systems in the same market? Uh, we we want all the Newton golfers to play in Wichita. <laughs> Newton wants all the Wichita golfers to play in Newton. How are you going to handle that? Yeah, we, we get that a lot and and really because um, we do manage golf courses in the same market, several places. And, uh, you know, we find that that the synergies are what really work. So if we're managing more of the properties, um, we can do some of those pricing strategies that Ben was talking about earlier, which can become even more fair to the golfers, you know, demand based pricing and you have more products. Uh, you're able to offer more things to more customers. So we, we find more synergy in that than than anything else, Dale. Is there a possibility of merging Sand Creek and the Wichita system at some point if this goes forward? Well, I, you know, I, I don't know about merging. You know, um, Sand Creek is Newton and these four golf courses are Wichita, but certainly creating efficiencies. I, you know, I don't think we've talked a lot about our efficiencies and national buying power and you know we've talked a lot about the equipment at the four golf courses and there's there's a lot of savings uh that come from buying through a firm like ours so it, it kind of offsets the fee and all uh however many if they're 35 or 40 municipal contracts they're all public information and we are uh uh you know it's this management fee per course is less than I think it came up at the last meeting less than we're charging at Sand Creek Station. Um, so we we knew in the spirit of time that we had to make this work for for the city. So um, that's why our fee is is where it is. Okay. Uh, next is Nancy. Hi. This is getting so late in our meeting, but as we're going through, I was just jotting down uh, quick questions. So I don't know if I think some of them will be very easily answered. One of them was, has, as Dale uh, alluded to, was what is the role of the Golf Advisory Committee in the new uh, model? 
and uh, as far as the determining fees and, and the public interest uh, perspective. Um, so that was that was one. And, and if you're going to answer that later on, Ben, with um, responses to Dale's questions, that that's quite fine. Um, the uh, Wichita Junior Golf uh, Foundation and scholarships, would that all go under First T or would First T have, would there, would the city or Junior Golf Feder uh, Foundation have a separate board that would manage those, that large amount of money and its scholarships that are going out? Uh, Nancy, this is Tom. Let me address that real quick because it's pretty yeah. simple. Um, First T and Wichita Junior Golf Association are are essentially we're we're both conducting the same types of programs. We're all in it for the same reasons. We want to grow the game of golf through junior golfs, right. golfers. Um, we have already started working directly with Wichita Junior Golf Foundation. Uh, we're going to, as it looks right now, we're going to take over all their registration process for this year. They're going to still operate their programs as they have in the past. We'll assist in any way we possibly can with that process. And as far as, like you mentioned, uh, the Wichita Junior Golf Association and their board and their finances, that nothing changes with that whatsoever. All the first T is going to do is, as at this point, assist in registration and initially helping with the programs getting set up, and then um, you know we'll take it year by year from there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask Mr. Layton if you had spoken with any of the other cities who Kemper has managed uh, their, their sets or systems of golf courses to uh, uh, get feedback or input from them or their perspectives of what's, how everything's going for them. Um, of course, you know, I, I'm, I have no doubts of Kemper's competency and everything like that, but I think it would be a, a just a little bit prudent to just go ahead and go straight to one of those systems in another town or city of similar setup as ours, just to check in with them on, on their proposal and what they did right or what they wish they had done differently with, with their proposal and contracts with, with their Kemper um, arrangements. Uh, Nancy, I, I don't disagree. We have reached out to get some information from Newton regarding Sand Creek. We also, I think, have reference information from um, Kemper in terms of who would contact people are. But again, I want to emphasize, I didn't want to get too far ahead of mm -hmm. all of you on the policy dire in the policy direction, and I didn't want to put Kemper through a tremendous more amount of work uh, until uh, I knew where you were on the process. Mm -hmm. Well, just checking in with those other places, I yep. think, would be a would be a good move. Yes. Um, um, let's see what was the other one. Um, okay, permanent employment, and and we've talked we'll uh, talked it to death. But I'm thinking about pros who may not be quite invest, you know, quite vested yet, and they don't won't just go get a, a lawn mowing job in the city somewhere probably so it would be unfortunate to lose some pros if uh, their concerns aren't addressed in um, that right. system. If, 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 you, if you don't mind Nancy, I um, it, after Nile asked that question, Mark Manning uh, took a look at our pension files to see where what the standing is for everyone and if you don't if you don't mind he can answer a little, at least part of your question. Oh sure. If yeah. Mark's still on. Yeah, Nancy, uh, just very briefly, without going into any details, the city has basically two pension systems. Everybody is vested in our pension system after two years. Now, you're you're vested with a defined benefit after seven years, but okay. you're, invested, you're vested with a defined contribution after two years. And I, I pulled our employees a week or two ago, 
And we've got about four or five in that lower tier, but the bottom line is they all have a vested retirement benefit and they would take it with them like a 401k, basically, the, the five that have less than seven years. Good, good, good. Assuming they chose to leave the city service. Uh-huh, okay. Um, I, oh, I know. Uh, when I looked at the, the very early slides, the uh, increased revenue from green fees compared to 20, uh, 2020 was a bumper crop year for us. And so this is your revenue represents like a 25% increase in green fees. And I'm just wondering how, without really jacking up the prices, how that's going to be accomplished, how, what the plan is for that. Uh, the courses were closed for two months in 2020. So, mm -hmm. and those are two significant spring months uh, is part of it. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that that's why 2020 looks odd. And we had the same situation at a number of our courses and that they were closed and then they did, uh, you know, have very good months afterwards. If you go back and sort of normalize the two months that were closed, the numbers are much closer than than they appear on the uh, chart. Also, mm -hmm. you know, we expect to grow food and beverage significantly. And since the pros own the pro shop, it's a little bit of an apples and oranges uh, comparison because the pro shop revenues are gross numbers where the 2020 numbers are net numbers. So that's why it gets a little not exactly an apples to apples. comparison. Yeah, well, I was just looking at the green fees numbers not the, the total, well, uh, but but the green fees, uh, we had so many more rounds of golf, even with those two months not there last last year, we still had, so if you're trying to extrapolate the two months that were missing with the level of rounds of golf and the green fees that were paid in the, you know, when we were really booming this last year, I don't know if that's a fair comparison, and that's where I felt like Richard's question about seeing the the financials for the the previous two years would be um, good information as well. Right, I think it'll be more time or a better use of time and and, and make sure that you know we're all talking on the same page that we put that we can do an exhibit on that. It's it's um, to make sure that we explain how we got there. If you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. I've got no problem with that. Great, great. Okay, thank you. I think that exhausts my my list. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, just to kind of touch on what happens to the GAC where that falls, I think that's, and Troy, correct me if I'm wrong, that would be up to the park board to decide uh, which direction we want to take there. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, before I get to Nile, uh, we're kind of wrapping up on the questions it looks like here. Um, so if everyone can kind of collect their thoughts, um, we'll kind of go down the list and, and gather um, how everybody feels about this in, in just a moment. So you guys are almost done. Bear with us, Ben and Josh and Alan and Tom. So I know we put you through the ringer today. So appreciate you hanging in there. We appreciate you having us, really. We do. Yes. Niall, take it away. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think it's something I need to understand, and we all are pretty well acknowledged, but Temper is, is um, in their presentation, has uh, related that they are going to have certain metrics that they feel like they, that they're going to set to feel like to measure their success. Um, we're going to have certain expectations of them in terms of uh, their success. But I think it's important to remember that once we step off the cliff here, uh, and if Kemper, did, for some reason or other, fails terribly or just doesn't meet the expectation to uh, our golfers, or in some way or another, the city is not happy about uh, what's going on, we're stuck. Are we, we, are we going to contemplate, ever contemplate, once we've uh, dismantled our entire golf system to rebuild it from scratch because we're not happy with our vendor? 
I mean, what what recourse do we have if, in fact, um, uh, Kemper is not able to meet its expectations? Good question. I'll let uh, Bob take this one. I'm sure we have a clawback clause in there somewhere. Eddie, can't you take this? Um, yeah, no, <laughs> it, it, it actually, it's a great question. And that's one of the reasons why the model is set the way that it is. Um, the courses, of course, are owned by us. All of the equipment will be owned by us. And so um, in terms of what it would, would be necessary, it's a matter of then staffing or restaffing up. If for some reason there are performance problems and performance will be established, performance standards will be established in the contract, um, there'll be a process where we notify uh, Kemper of deficiencies. Kemper then has a period of time to cure. That's how we normally do the contracts with performance standards. And then only if, if we get to a point where uh, performance issues have not been addressed, uh, there'll be some provision then for us to be able to terminate the contract with cause. Um, the um, And so I, and I, I think that addresses your issue that if Kemper uh, didn't perform, um, we're not left holding the bag where we have to go out and buy a whole fleet of carts. We have to go out and buy all the maintenance equipment, uh, which obviously would be uh, a, you know, cost prohibitive to us. So Bob, what, what would you estimate the time frame to ramp that up from hiring a, um, all new staff, new pros, new mowers, new mowing people, new director of golf, how long would you think it would take to ramp all that up? You know, I probably would turn that over to uh, uh, Troy to, to come up with an estimate. It's a little more up his alley than mine. So there's a lot of different moving parts in regards to taking care of all those needs. Uh, we have purchasing processes that we have to go through and, and bid the, these major pieces of equipment. So it's going to take us a while. Uh, another big challenge is our hiring process. You know, going out there and advertising and looking for somebody who uh, take the place of Mr. Hendricks. Uh, you know, to realistically, I would say to ramp back up and take care of all those items, we're looking at four or five months to really do it correctly and, and have the correct staff and have the correct equipment. Okay. Well, out of respect for everybody's time, if, um, if you don't mind, uh, we'll kind of start at the top here. I know a couple of us have to jump off in a minute, so I'll start with uh, Ty Tabing to kind of wrap his thoughts up, and um, yeah, we'll just go down the list. If you guys have any more follow-up questions, please loop that into your final thoughts. You said you're starting with me. Is that right? Well, you said you have to jump off soon. So um, yeah. well, okay, uh, fair enough. Um, well, you know, look, I I uh, have a lot of respect for Kemper. I've I've seen them actually do great things in the Chicago land area. Um, at the end of the day, for me, um, it's about assuring we get the best deal. And I'm not sure that the process that we've gone through provides that guarantee to me. Uh, my inclination is to. Um, think about it uh, for the next 10 days until the next park board meeting. Um, I'm inclined at this point to, um, you know, try and see if we can do an RFP. Um, that's where I am. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Alejo next. Thank you. Um, yeah, from my end, I mean, I uh, obviously I'm, it's really impressive to see what Kemper Sports been able to do. Um, I yeah, I guess it's a lot. It's a lot to digest. Um, I'm, I'm I'm leaning towards uh, what Ty had said. I mean, I think uh, I don't know. I, I want to make sure that from our end we are dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's. And it's not to say that, Bob, you haven't done that. It's just that, um, I don't know. I, 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 uh, I have some reservations, but I, I, 
I think that Kemper is very impressive, and I think that this this could be something that is exceptional. I just, you know, um, I'm not ready. I don't know. I guess I'm not. I'm not confident to jump off the cliff yet. Not to say this jumping, working with Kemper is jumping off a cliff, but you know what I mean. <laughs> a little hesitant. A little hes, and I could change in ten days. I mean, I'm. I, I like I said, I'm. I, taking notes and I need to go through this again, but um, I, I think we should revisit this again at our park meeting here in the next week. Thank you, Alejo. And guys, feel free to hop off. I know you probably got a six o'clock that you need to scoot to, so don't feel free to hang around or anything. So appreciate you guys being on and, and for your time today. Well, thank you guys. Um, let's go with Niall next. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Um, I, I, I'm good to stick around for the duration, but my, uh, my thoughts right now are that uh, without some kind of, uh, uh, you know, without some kind of clawback or some way of uh, being able to hold Kemper accountable uh, for performance, um, that part really, really bothers me because I, I don't think we could ramp golf up in four months. Uh, I, overall, uh, I think if, if it's the will of the park board and the will of the council to privatize the management of, of city golf, then that should be uh, taking that straight up with an RFP uh, to look at all of the um, uh, available vendors and uh, make the best deal out of it. So I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with uh, uh, having a, just a single vendor uh, proposal without um, the chance to see what others could provide for us. Thank you, Niall. Uh, we'll go to Dale Goder next. Uh, thank you. Um, just some, I, I would echo the last three comments about the need for a measured approach to an RFP. I think those are all well-based. Ty, Leo, and, and, and Niall. I have a question. Mr. Hendricks has left us. That position is open. Again, this could be answered later. Are we filling that position? If not, how does that fit into the current budget scenario? Um, I just need some clarity on the administrative status here. If we make changes in green fees, who does that? How does that flow? I'd like some definition to that going forward as well, what the process is for uh, taking that to council ultimately and uh, and how that comes and goes. Um, again, um, as a golfer, my last thing is to the manager, unfreeze the hiring, get the seasonal workers out there. You're going to wreck my greens and I'm going to be really pissed off. The courses need to run, uh, regardless of what happens, we need to run the courses in a professional model. And that means buying the equipment we need now, we have the money hire the people to do it uh, because uh, we just need to be professional in what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Um, Bob, if you want to respond, I'll give you a chance here. Um, if not, we can keep moving. I heard Dale. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Noted. That's the, that's the first time. Thank you. Um, let's see here, uh, Nancy. I don't think I had my hand up. Oh, just a couple of parting thoughts for us. Oh. If you got them. For me? Oh, um, I think it could be okay. I don't see the point of having a city golf division manager if you've got a business managing the courses so i don't see what that role would look like and it was a pretty expensive role and originally um i my my question is what the function of the gac is because that's where i am um i wouldn't mind seeing an rfp i just I, I don't know what the optics are for the council members i i don't i don't know so that's Ryan. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. 
Um, going down the list here, Michael Ward. Hey, Eddie. Um, again, I, I thank everybody for their time. I, I, um, I think there's a couple things evident. You, the city needs to get out of the golf business, and the, the most efficient way to do that is probably by turning it over to private management in some capacity. Um, but I also think there's more than one ways for the city to get out of the golf business. Uh, we've seen one way in which it can be done. And uh, there's been a lot of comments about RFPs and, and free markets and, and what may be. Um, and I think I'm on board as far as, hey, what else is out there and, and evaluate down the road and pick the option, um, which is going to be very difficult that the city agrees on um, to most benefit. Not only the city getting out of the golf business, not out of the, the local area, um, you know, benefiting from what that leads to, uh, but also the management company being put in the best position to succeed, whoever that may be. So uh, kind of on board as far as some of the previous comments. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Richard. Yeah, thank you very much. And I sure want to thank uh, Kemper and and everybody else here who participated. Um, I'll make it very brief. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that that it's going to be a major change if we do this, um, because our model is going to go back to a pass system as opposed to a membership system. Because even though you can call it a membership, it's it's actually going to be a pass that allow you to play certain times, and um, and we um, as far as some of the income numbers um, I'm not sure some of them are totally fair because we haven't been allowed to um, to manage the concessions we've been asking for over a year to um, to increase fees and um, at minimum even if we keep the current system we've got to have a streamlined system that allows it to operate as a business um, but I it, I'm going to be very interested to see what the month over month uh, numbers are for the last 10 months. And, um, and uh, you know, part of the model was to really go out and, and work on um, some of the higher price memberships and the couples and to get it up into the um, 1800 uh, number. And it would be interesting to see if, if we had that what the um, what we were looking at because you the the factor the uh, the COVID factor um, is going to be you know hard to determine I mean I don't know how you sit down and say how many how many of these people who are playing now will or will not play if the um, if the community opens back up but the one thing you can say is if you the membership people I would think are not COVID related golfers. There are people who will are looking at value and will likely stick around. And, and as I said, the, the model was borrowed from from a, a local um, uh, a nonprofit who has built the, the best facilities in the country. And um, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to be convinced that that it is the right time to get away from that model. Um, when I think it's going to show that the last um, eight months of last year, we probably made close to a million dollars. So that's my Thank you, Richard. Uh, Tori. Um, yes. So I, you know, I'm pretty well aligned with Alejo and Ty. Um, you know, I appreciate the presentation from Kemper. I, they have, you know, things down, especially the corporate side of things down. Uh, competency was never really a question for me in this. It was just a matter of, um, you know, what's best for our city and our golfers and everything else. So, you know, it was mentioned that this has been worked on for months and months now. And had that been the case, it sounds like there would have been time for us to put an RFP out. So that the timeline is kind of confusing to me. You know, things take longer than they should, especially in government. So I hate to be one of those people that drag things out even further. Um, but d just to pop up with kind of one option without giving a chance for anybody else to participate, 
uh, you know, I feel like that's kind of our fiduciary responsibility here, being the liaison between uh, the public and the city. So uh, I, I kind of wish we would have been part of this process earlier on, but here we are. So I'd, I'd like to think on it a little bit more as well. If, if there would be a way to do an RFP without um, causing more damage than good, I think that I would like to consider that as well. Thank you, Tori. <clears throat> and I guess uh, last but not least here, um, you know, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I came into this with several concerns. And as I said earlier, you, you touched on all of those concerns in this proposal. Um, so credit to you guys. Um, it, you know, one of my one of my concerns, for instance, is you guys come in with a obviously a blanket model, and there's some efficiencies to that. However, we're talking about four very different golf courses here. Um, so Mac Park might need something that's different than than Tex and Sim, different from Auburn, and and et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted that wanted to keep that communal vibe, if you will. Um, that that community asset, um, you know, because each each clubhouse feels different when you walk into it. Um, you know, they're obviously a big open space, but um, you know, sit down with your friends. There's there's different feelings that you get in each one, and I think anybody that's been in um, all four of our golf courses can attest to that. But you guys hit it on the head. Um, you know, if if the rest of us would say you know, let's go with these guys. Um, you know, I would have no issues with that. Um, however, you know, based on the, what I've heard in the past 10 minutes or so, uh, it sounds like, you know, we, we want to do a little bit of our due diligence, if you will. Um, and, and coming into that, that was another concern of mine is how did we get here? Um, but again, you guys, you guys explained it very well. Uh, Manager Layton, um, Troy, Appreciate you guys working really hard on this. Um, certainly, this does not discount anything that that you guys see or um, you know talked about in the past few months. Um, you know, of course, I think everybody's got the same goal here, and that's to uh, create a viable, sustainable um, golf system. Um, and if if that's private management, then so be it. Um, and again, if if we go out to RFP, you know, I. Who's to say that that Kemper isn't the best option, and that they very, very well could be? Um, you know, they've they've definitely got a head start on uh, on the next guy. So um, appreciate you guys, um, Alan, Tom, Ben, and and Josh. Thank you guys for coming. Um, you know, of course, as always, if you have any questions for any of us, um, our emails, our phones are are open. Happy to happy to talk to you. Um, but as, as far as moving forward, um, you know, I, the last 10 minutes, um, I think it was pretty clear. Um, and, I, and Bob, I, I hope it was clear to, to you as well and, and Troy. Um, so I hope you guys got what you needed. Um, so with that, I'll leave it there. Troy, um, Bob, do you have any questions for the GAC or the park board? I do not. I think we have some information and there's definitely some questions that we can still follow up on and provide that information. And um, this just gives us a lot of good insight. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we provided the information that we had. Uh, the proposal was was a very interesting proposal and we wanted to make sure that you guys had a chance to see that and consider it. Um, so we'll, we'll take it from here. Okay. Again, I, I can't reiterate enough uh, our gratitude for Kemper and First Tee for being on and and getting to this this point. Um, you know, certainly there's some eye-opening things um, that we've obviously we've we've known there was a issue for for quite some time, but um, you know they uh, they got us here and um, hopefully we can we can figure it out in the future. So with that, guys. Um, just past six o'clock. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, if there's nothing else, uh, this meeting will be adjourned. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.